Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the return of the Stream of Nations. For the final time, we are covering Arcane today because this is Saturday. And Saturdays, for those of you who have not heard me say this uh, because you're on YouTube and watching this on YouTube, are dedicated to Arcane Days. Uh, the way the format works in very, very simple is when I wake up first thing in the morning, I sit down and I watch whatever episode is coming is next. The next upcoming episode. I'll be doing my best to keep track of this on both the spreadsheet, the Discord, and the website. I have vehicles on all three. We'll talk about all three in just a second. But the idea here is I watch the next episode, then I sit down here, I go live on stream, and I say hey, and everyone says hey, and we're all we're all just cool, right? Immediately after that, we discuss the episode, we give it our rating as to what we want it to rate it from, from basically a zero to six, I think it is, uh, scale. And then once it's been properly rated, we go ahead and shut off and assuming that we have other time left in the day, we go ahead and we immediately go and start watching the next episode. And by we, I mean offline, because I can't do this stuff live. Trust me, this would be such a better format if I could do this live. Trust me, I've done it, just not on stream, not on YouTube, because YouTube would demonetize and destroy my channel, and then stream would, would kill me with sticks. So, we go watch the next episode. I take my notes, take down my notes. Um, and then immediately after this, we go ahead and we get back and we repeat the process. Saturdays are devoted to Arcane for the foreseeable future. Basically, until Arcane is done. Once, uh, other than that, every other show will be covered from Sunday over to Friday. And then our, and then Saturday will be Arcane days again. Make sense? This is to make sure that more people, especially certain specific, specific people, can be here and present for the Arcane Streaminations. Um, the actual specific shows we'll be covering are, for those of you not paying attention, in order... We'll be covering, obviously, Arcane. Uh, on the, we'll be doing Clone Wars Season 7, Andor Season 1, Mandalorian Season 1 and 2, Cyberpunk Edge Runners, four episodes of the Donkey Kong Country show, and then Tangled. And those will be the shows we'll be covering in that order. We'll be doing this in one giant block. We're doing all the streaminations and getting all those done. I have sat on this for far too long, and I'm going to be devoting 100% of my stream time and work time to getting all of this pushed through. Not because I'm in a hurry or because I want to get it done or over with or anything like that, but because I have been entirely too behind on the streaminations format, and that is 100% my fault. Because I, to explain a little bit, I've been trying to get caught up in the queue in the streams, in the review streams, and I have failed at that. I am still not, as of this very second, caught up in the queue there. So I'm trying to get caught up there. I'm failing at it, so I decided, because of everything else going on at the same time, and the move, and the packing the house, and all that, we're just going to do the streaminations. We're going to focus on them, and we're going to stop, you know, neglecting them, and, and then finally get back onto it. So, that's the idea there. A couple of things here. So, on uh, the Discord. On Discord, we have a channel, which is called the Streaminations channel. Uh, that channel has a link to the spreadsheet. You can find a link to the spreadsheet in chat if you type exclamation mark Streamination or exclamation mark Streaminations. That will also say our current status. It will say the next episode that we're about, what we're going to be watching for both the Saturday block and the Everything Else block. I'll be doing my best to keep that updated. If I fall behind, I apologize. There will also be a website. Did you know I have a website? Now, the website will be not quite as uh, up-to-date because of obvious, but the idea is I'll be keeping track on the website. If you look on the left-handed block of the website, scroll down a little bit, just below the word blocks, you'll see upcoming streaminations, where it'll mention the, late, the latest Arcane episode we've got coming up, and then what show we've got coming up on, on what day. So the idea here is that that's obviously I have Clone Wars Season 7 listed for tomorrow. I have no idea how long it's going to take us to get through Clone Wars Season 7. Who knows, right? We There's no, like, slotted time, right? I don't have, like, 33 minutes and 18 seconds to talk about an episode. Just like the Ruminations format, we talk until we have nothing left to talk about. Make sense? So once I know the next show is going to be present for that, I will go ahead and update the website with a timestamp for the relative time. We'll be going ahead and covering the next show. This will also be something I'll be keeping track of on the spreadsheet, which I just mentioned on both. No, thank you for asking, Spartan. On the spreadsheet, which will be, which have, I'm staring at right here. Uh, like I said, you can type Streamination or Streaminations in chat to get a link to that. It's also linked in the Discrimination channel on Discord. I suppose I should also put a link to this into the videos. Um, maybe I shouldn't. I don't think I'm going to do that. But anyways, point being, uh, that will show what we're at currently, because if you were to look at the stream of nations right now, you will see that it's nice, big, empty, blank square, because we haven't done anything yet. But as we finish a given episode, as one of the final steps of finishing up an episode, I will go ahead and fill in the color on the episode, as well as fill in the uh, counter to show how the episode's show, excuse me, how the show is doing, and then that'll kind of give you an immediate visual indicator of where we are and what's next. 
That's three separate things I've got to keep track of as I'm going through this. Please forgive me if I screw up because I'm terrible. Now, let's get to Arcane in particular. Also, if you have any questions, hit me. No, not literally! Ugh. Okay, so... Let me go ahead and say that League of Legends totally sucks oars. I have actually tried multiple times in my life to get into League of Legends. Mostly because there are aspects of the MOBA format that I enjoy. None of which exist in League of Legends. Literally none. I'm not actually being facetious. None of which exist in League of Legends. Uh, so each time I have attempted that, that has not worked out. And each time I have been rebuffed hard by a game I don't enjoy and a populace that can go directly to hell. Um, now, I do know that there are good people who play League of Legends, because of course there are, right? It's just, from completely anecdotal experience, I have not had a good experience with the people who play League of Legends. Like, I, like it's it's just, it's my, my horrible, my horrible dice rolls, right? The moment I pop in, there's someone who's just an absolute asshole to me. And I, like, I, I always feel like if I had waited like three additional seconds, maybe I would have gotten a cool group. Like, I actually got chewed out and cussed out in FF14 recently. You know FF14's uh, re uh, reputation for, for having a cool community. So it's just, I just I just have the worst luck when it comes to these kind of things. It's insane. Yes, really, this is not a joke. This really did happen. So, the thing is, though, uh, this was just a couple of days ago, Giga. The thing is here, I have come to the decision, when it comes to Arcane specifically, that I want to not look into it, if that makes any sense. Uh, this this ties into what Imperial Starter Store asked earlier. I kind of want to walk in from, a, from, from the perspective of a complete outsider. So, because here's the deal, once upon a time, and this is years ago, uh, I was curious enough to look into some of the greater lore of Runeterra, and then they changed it, and then they changed it again. Um, but the point is, I am aware of the fact that there is actual lore to League of Legends. I know that. Like, that's, that's not something you gotta... I did a lore run of Call of Duty. What do you want from me? So I do know that there is lore, there is story, there's world building, there's all kinds of fun stuff there. I also know that the team, Riot, I believe, has actually been doing a lot of work for a lot of years at this point and trying to stretch that lore out into a lot of different things other than League of Legends. I've always gotten the mental impression that League is like the cash cow, right? And they use that to fund the stuff they actually want to do. I don't know, just vibe I get. I could I could be projecting a little bit. It's a good strategy, though, if that's true, because it's working. Um, so, here we are, looking at Arcane, one of those little branches out to see it, and get a little bit of a vibe and a feel on exactly what's going on within this setting. So I wanted to share that up front. If there's anything... Uh, like, do me a favor, don't, like, be like, oh, ho, ho, you think the red hair is significant? Well, little do you know. Please don't do that, because I'm going to pick up on it immediately and immediately deduce everything. But uh, I am legitimately curious how different my experience is from the perspective of any of you who are actually more familiar with the Great Lore of Runeterra. So, what do we start off with? Giant explosion. <laughs> evil stormtroopers of evil. Obviously, you got to have evil stormtroopers of evil. Uh, a lot of fire, a lot of corpses, a lot of debris, and the this intro is so good. It's so good. Uh, it accomplishes almost everything it needs to functionally with no dialogue. There's, I know, there's the song that Powder is singing to herself in order to keep herself distracted from the nightmarish horror that's around her. But for all intents and purposes, there's no dialogue there, which is awesome for years. Years upon years, I have been banging on the point of showing, not telling. Or showing, then telling. I'm okay with that, too. This is a great example of that. Um, you've got the red-haired girl who is trying to hold it together and failing. And you've got the blue-haired girl who's trying not to look at it and failing. That already gives us immediate insight into the variant mindsets of these two characters, Powder and Vi. Uh, or rather, Vi and then Powder. Vi is someone who's obviously the older one who is trying to be the more mature, trying to be the one who's looking after, trying to be older than she is, for lack of a better way to put that, and is kind of failing at that because of the various emotional responsibilities and obviously the more dystopian aspect of the society that she lives in, and Powder is just trying to shut it all out completely. Two different ways to deal with trauma. Process and fail, and avoid and fail. Some really great characterization done in just a few seconds with nothing more than a few visuals and a wonderful, wonderful bit of, uh, let's call it storyboarding. 
in the way that they're positioned, in the way that they're shown. I kept being afraid as I kept watching the intro. I kept waiting. I kept waiting for someone to be like, The day the bridge exploded was the final day of peace on Bobsville. That was the day I, you know, I, I, kept, I kept waiting for that to happen. And it didn't. I kept waiting for the show to fail me, for lack of a better way to do it, to, to put that. And it kept not failing me. It kept actually nailing it. Um, and it never got into the point of gross, which is actually really hard to do when you have a bunch of corpses on a destroyed bridge, by the way. So credit where credit is due on that front as well. As you know, on that day, it's just... Meh. Um, and yeah, I do. I actually do know exactly what you're talking about, Lord Harrow. Mm. So yeah, I, you know me, uh, ISD. You know I love a show that actually respects me. That's why I like My Little Pony. And that sounds like a joke, but it's not. Uh, more specifically, it's also why I don't like the recent My Little Pony show. But I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Let's keep talking about Arcane. So um, I also love two little tidbits that instantly indicate. Again, I hate I hate to keep bashing this point in. But so many other shows, games, books, movies would have them look to their parents. It's so obviously their parents, right? In fact, I don't think it ever confirmed in the entire episode it was their parents. But it's so obviously their parents. Because, duh. And I just kept waiting to be like... Then I turned. And I looked at my at my parents who were over there. Or for the, for the guy, Vander, to be like... Those your parents over there? Is that the people who biologically gave birth to you? by engaging in copulation and then a nine-month ter nine term pregnancy to push you out of her vagina. Is that what that is? Is that what... No, no. Instead, the camera just pans over to them. We see their reaction to them, and we see that the mother has purple hair, which is a nice touch. And that's it. All That's all we need to know. In fact, honestly, there's probably a good chance that th those wouldn't even necessarily have to be her parents, but it doesn't matter, does it? Whoever they were, they were significant to them. Yeah, one glance. That's all we need. That's all we need. Now, obviously, based on further context clues, they were their parents, either adoptive or biological. It doesn't matter. Because they were obviously their caretakers one way or the other, because now they're living under Vander and don't have anyone else as a caretaker. So, boom. But again, that is such... It's, it's, it's frustrating, Roman Care. It's frustrating as someone who analyzes art for a living, I might add. To look at this and just be like, it's like doing it right. Oh my god. And you let us I'm like two minutes into the episode here. I'm I'm sorry for gushing, but this this intro is incredibly powerful. And exactly as it should be. Then we have uh, sorry, real quick. In my in my notes here, I said I just started putting name or blue or red, because none of their names are presented in the intro. Vander is over there doing something that's actually a character establishing moment. I'll talk about that in just a second. But then, uh, he's, he's beating the crap out of one of the enforcers, goes over, sees the girls, literally throws down his weapons, and we get a nice close-up shot of those weapons, which is part of that character establishment moment I'll talk about in a minute, and then picks up the girls and takes them off the bridge. So, that's awesome. The fact that It says so much about his character immediately that the obvious rebel type... I'm sorry, he looks like a rebel type who was fighting the frickin' stormtroopers. So obviously he's a rebel type. Throwing down his weapons. Literally to be able to pick up the children and carry them away from this carnage. Yeah. That's per that that's his character arc right there. You can just see it pre presented on, on display. It's so obvious. I feel stupid for sharing it. Um, but it's good. No, it's good. None of, none of that is a complaint about the episode proper. So, then they start doing the heist thing. We've got to do this this tone center. We start off very, 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 very dark. And then we have a more lighthearted kind of a thing to pull the tone up a little bit, right? And after the lighthearted thing pulling up the tone a little bit, things have to get a little bit more serious. You know, something has to go wrong. That establishes a threat, but not a high-scale threat, just a threat. And as soon as the threat has been pushed through, we have to have another breather moment followed by a conclusionary moment. And after the conclusion moment, we've reset the scene and we can start over. That's the pacing. I know I talk I talk a lot about pacing uh, when it comes to things. And there's a, there's story pacing and there's gameplay pacing. And in this case, obviously, um, the story pacing here is nothing short of fantastic. This it, It's so formulaic, but in an extremely good way. Little pro tip. 
If you ever hear someone say that something is bad because it's formulaic, I'm guilty of this as well. What we mean is because it, it is it's bad. Something being formulaic is not bad. Something being bad is bad. There's a really good value to things like the three-second rule or the two-thirds rule or um, the, uh, the, the cliffs and troughs approach to pacing, right? These are all things that are well-established. These are all things that have long long standing rules and, ex and 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 executions that we can break down into this many seconds should be spent on this type of shot kind of a thing like this is a well trod well studied ground but there's nothing wrong with walking on that path of well trod ground to continue the analogy slightly there's nothing wrong with having something formulaic there's nothing wrong with doing things according to the trope what depends on what matters is how well you execute it this is an excellent execution i have to go and mention here that at one point at the 25 or so minute mark i realized that it had been 25 minutes since i started the episode and it felt like it had been two i'm, I'm not exaggerating the pacing of this is so good and that's important and so what the specific type of pacing i can actually talk about it visually here I've, I've, I've mentioned this before there's lots of different types of pacing and good pacing in this case it's right this is a slow escalation build up to the tension uh okay well nobody's gonna see my face for like a minute and a half jesus christ arch monster um well i can't show you I can't show you the thing. I can't. I can't physically show you the thing. <laughs> Darth Monster's like, no, you will never show these people what you mean by this by this visual reference. Okay, okay, I'm gonna wait for it. I'm gonna wait for it. Okay, so there's the slow escalation. Then it peaks into a high tension moment. And then it breaks. Down into a low tension moment. And that's that's the type of pacing. Rise, plummet. Rise, plummet. Uh, tension doesn't have to be action. A lot of people misunderstand that. A lot of people think that tension has to be something that is, you know, dun -a -dun -a -dun -a -dun -dun. but tension can be very, very quiet too. We actually talked about this during the Justified Streamonations, where there are several moments in Justified which are very, very, very quiet, but absolutely tense. Like you can feel the lightning just wire in the background, right? Uh, almost every single one. If, uh, by the way, if you haven't seen Justified, I highly recommend it. I'm never watching the show again because I hate it, but it's one of the best shows I've ever seen. I extremely highly recommend it. Anyways, so Justified, um, it, it does this wonderful thing where almost every episode has a, a gun duel, right? Because it's it based in many ways off of a Western. But it's really clever with how these duels work. There's not always a gun involved. There's not always, you know, just two people involved, but there's always some kind of a duel in almost every episode. And those are your tension moments, which can be action-y, but often aren't. So tension, that's why I use the word tension. It can be all kinds of things here, um, like having a really intense character moment or having a threat of something happen or something. That can be a tension moment. If you're sitting quietly in the corner and 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 you're just you're 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 trying very hard to control your breathing and you just hear this kong 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 going on in the background as you're trying to avoid whatever that is that's a high tension moment right uh, you can also of course have a typical high action tension moment they have several in this very episode in fact the first one they have is them running through the streets away from the enforcers in, in a big action sequence so you get it right like that that's that's the kind of thing that that would work so the pacing this episode is nothing short of amazing yeah, these are still going, but this is still going. Oh my god. So, speaking of details, um, when Vi comes off of the roof, the fascia on the on the roof actually bends a little bit from where she puts her foot down onto it, and it stays bent uh, for the rest for the rest of the shot, which is fascinating. Um, there's I, I'm only mentioning this one detail. I'm going to do my best to not mention every tiny animation detail there is in this, this show. Because if I do, then the entire show of me discussing it will just be, and then there's this thing in the background, and then there's this thing in the background, and then there's this thing in the background, and then there's this thing in the background. Because that's just, that's just gonna be a thing. That's just gonna, there is so, 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 so much attention to details. The visual, visual media equivalent of doodad design here is nothing short of fantastic.
Yeah, I'll spend four hours every episode. And then there was this thing. So much, so much, so much, so much stuff. Oh my gosh. Um, I also have to say that I sort of struggle with putting into words how much the overall visual aesthetic of the show works for me. Uh, it's very dishonored. And I do mean that as a positive thing. Very oil painting painted onto 3D objects. And you'll notice that they also pull the same general trick, and a different expression, but the same type of trick that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom do. Uh, if you're not familiar with those games, they're, most of those games lean on shadows and shading and lighting to create depth to it, rather than trying to lean on things like texture. Now, this is actually a some, somewhat more recent uh, thing, which has is, which is been gaining ground for about... I don't know, maybe like the last 10 or so years in terms of animation and visual design. Because if you remember before that, everything was like texture, 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 texture. And then people forgot how to do really, really good, you know, visual design. <laughs> I can just say that bluntly. So very cool rendering technique. I love it. Uh, makes the whole show pop in several ways. And I'm, I don't even know where to begin with the animation, the facial animation, the body language absolutely top-notch stuff across the board again I, I feel silly pointing it out because of how incredible it is and on display it is but there it is uh oh hi cody thank you for the sub always appreciate if you know um, what up to three things you'd like. oh you want to put towards lord choice you got it give me one moment I'll write this down here. oh yeah these people feel like real people which is funny because their body types are so varied and you can only get that kind of a thing with this it's very pixar and trust me coming from me that's a freaking compliment. Oh my god, are these still going? Uh, these are still going. Oh my god, they're still going. Uh, I do love... I was actually about to comment on that Federation Builder because towards the initial... as part of the initial fight, as part of the initial tension sequence, um, we've got... Actually, I hadn't caught that yet, excuse me. But there's that freaking... Uh, the, 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 the bolas, I think is the right word? They've got these little spheres that they throw, which have parts of them that rotate out in order to ca wrap around someone and catch their legs or catch their arms or something, uh, based on a real-life weapon of a similar type with just a slightly more soul cyber, or not cyberpunk, excuse me, steampunky aesthetic to the same concept. And it is bolus. I was right. Woo! Being right for once. Oh my god, I think they stopped. Um, so that's awesome, and I love I love a lot of the little things that they showcase. And there's a there's a very steampunky vibe going on here, uh, which is actually interesting. I didn't know. Uh, Room Terra had a steampunky thing going on, but we'll get more to that in a minute. Moving on. For those of you uh, new to the show, I'd like to say thank you to people through Donate or, or you know, enable me to keep doing things like eating food and, and having a house over my head. So, um, thank you, Imperial Star Destroyer. I actually did miss that. I apologize, which is strange. I had it up. It should have notified me. I'll have to double check that. Um, I don't see it. Could you do me a weird favor, Imperial Star Destroyer? Not that I doubt you, but could you do me a favor and hit refresh and see if a button shows up saying, hey, just just for my sake, just to keep paperwork a little bit easier. And Darch Monster, thank you very, 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 very much for entirely too many subs. Always appreciate Darth Monster. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. If you know what you want that to go towards, up to three things, please let me know. Looking at my notes here, trying to figure out what the hell I was. Oil painting. Eh. So we've got some initial character establishment. Um, don't do it, Mr. Red. Don't do it. Uh, no, it didn't, but I, I do believe you, Imperial Star. I don't think you're lying to me. I don't know why it's not showing up. Whatever. <sighs> Initial character established. We've got a heavy, okay, big dude, just jumps across the roofs. We've got the confident, however, the, the problematic rogue who thinks more of himself than he actually is. We've got the leader of the pack, that's Vi, who is actually probably the best actual fighter of the group. 
And then the only one who actually recognizes any of the crap in the inventor's place, whose name is Powder. And there is some interesting development there, and we've got our team dynamic almost immediately. Uh, not even in a League of Legends way, just in a, you know, the the D and D group, right? Like we've got our barbarian, we've got our rogue, we've got our fighter, and we've got our artificer. Okay, I'm with it. I'm with it. We also get a weirdly large amount of emphasis on these blowing glue plot coupons. I have the biggest feeling that I'm supposed to know what they are based on the game. Don't tell me. But, but it's interesting to note that even if you don't know what they are, it's made fairly quickly apparent what they can accomplish. Because um, each of them, uh, because we actually see exactly how they operate as things start to go to hell, as the initial uh, escalation happens towards our first major tension point. Um... Sorry, I do not see it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm I do believe you. Like I said, I'm not calling you a liar. I do know why I think. I thank you for telling me it's three months because I didn't write down three months. It's good to know. <clears throat> thank you for three months of support. Even though I'm terrible and awful. Um, the slow buildup of kinetic energy, right? It takes a while for it to actually explode. And it is interesting, though, because it feels like its own energy is, like, propelling it a little bit. You know, oh, that makes it go bounce further. That makes it bounce further. That makes it bounce further. Right. Um, stuff like that. So that's that's pretty cool in its own right. Uh, I'm hitting the wrong button. Excuse me. There we go. <clears throat> Just rolling down my notes. Uh, it's a fairly localized explosion, too, which I find fascinating. Like, did you pay attention to how little damage they did? Because I did, and I found that fascinating. I don't know if that's a plot point or not, but it, it is very fascinating the way that worked out. A uh, huge chunk of the building is actually just fine. So, then we get our big action tension sequence. We already have the, the bolas that I already mentioned. We see a little bit more of the enforcers without the Stormtrooper death masks on them. We see easel games. Obviously, got to see easel games. The architecture of this place immediately called the mind to song of, of uh, Witcher 3. Those are not aware of it. Very Mediterranean. Very Mediterranean. Very uh, Italian is actually the specific word I'd want to use there. Naturally, the transition from this big escape sequence into the next area involves going through a literal sewers. Um, yeah, apparently, Savicom, apparently I need to just stop streaming entirely so people stop doing anything. Thank you, Diesel Games, very much. Always appreciate. Much obliged. Thank you. No Sinister Wing, bad. Uh... Let's see, so... Okay, so trails in the sky block. Trails of Crossbell Duology. And Tales of Vesperia. Ember's area, but also Vesperia. Thank you, Easel. Oops. So... I, again, I feel I feel stupid for pointing out the obvious. We had the the upper streets, you know, rich land. Although I hesitate to call it rich land, but it is it, right. It's so obviously rich land because then we go to uh, poor land. Now, this is interesting to me as well. Uh, so in poor land, we have uh, wood, dirty streets. Uh, it's actually literally darker. Did you notice that? It, there's now. This is almost entirely because they're going through alleyways instead of being out in the open. But the actual lighting levels of everything was just pulled down several steps. Uh, there's wooden boards blocking things up. There's peeling paint. Some of the the walls need some maintenance. You get it. The usual stuff to establish that this is the poor district. Now, obviously, this whole sequence establishes the setting. We've got the rich and the poor districts, and the setting. We've got some kids who have some kind of past experience with them um, and are unwilling to deal with the mugging and the fact that this is just kind of the thing they can deal with. And this actually turns into a plot point later on. But what I find most interesting about this is two, twofold. First, the actual fight, a little slow mo -y. I was actually going to be upset about that, but I kind of get why they did that. 
because they really wanted to show, like they wanted the viewer to not miss anything. In short, it's very slow mo because the fight is ugly, mean, and dirty, just like. A real fight would be to be quite honest with you. if you've ever been in a real life like an actual fist fight they're not fun they're not glorious they're not like oh yeah you know it's, it's not the matrix it's not a kung fu movie it's not whatever you've seen in a video game it's pretty nasty yeah, it, it sucks um and of course that that's all ugly i'm going to keep using that word ugly and the entire fight is shown from powder's perspective Obviously, the, eye, the, the camera never moves behind her eyes, but instead what it is is the camera is always focusing on her because she is the center point of this whole thing. We see the, the aversion to violence, obviously, but also some elements of PTSD that are pushing through her as she's watching this and as she's just freaking out over the whole thing. So she runs for it, uh, tries to get away, the one last Kai, and she's by herself and she can't put up a fight, and... That's a good example of what I mean by tension, by the way. The scene where it's just her and the one nameless thug is actually a surprisingly tense scene because she obviously can't fight. She has no real method to defend herself of any means since the only grenade bomb she tried to use didn't work and we all knew it wasn't going to work. And he very clearly wants to cause her a great deal of harm for the frustrations and aggravations he's already been through. So that's a good example of what I mean by tension moment uh, without actually having to have the literal fight. Um, Which, so, then, we go, so we've got, another thing they show, actually, really quick here, is the slums, is it's actually overgrown. There's literally foliage that's just starting to to overgrow and, and, and kind of build itself out of them. But anyways, moving on, moving on. So we go from the overground, that's the rich district, to the, to the poor ground, which is the poor district. And then we go into the literal underground. Now, ironically, and I think this is done on purpose, the literal underground is kept in better uh, shape than the poor district, probably on purpose, probably because the poor district is the poor district, whereas the underground is the, uh, let's call it the undesirables district. Very, very, very alien vibe. And I could describe each three of these, uh, each three of these spots with a single word. We've got uh, sterilized, we've got desiccated, and we've got alien. Interesting contrast between the three, and very, very clearly built kind of in a vertical sense, too, even as the shot's going down. Literally, the shot is actually descending down into this chasm. It We see that there's people, not just on the floor at the bottom, but at all layers up along the walls on both sides, and there's, there's uh, bridges and, and ladders and all kinds of stuff, allowing people to access the different layers of this chasm. It's also our first shot of the fact that there's species other than humans in this particular, uh, uh, in this setting. Which I obviously knew from League of Legends, but still, this is our first showcasing within the show to, yeah, there's more here than just people of uh, human type. I, 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 I'm trying not to repeat myself. There's more than just humans. There's more than just humans. So we've got our class divides, plural, by the way. There's also this kind of green fog over everything. I don't know if that'll ever come up, but I did notice the gas mask thing. So, we go down to the alien section. This is actually a really great world-building section, which, I, again, as, as usual, I feel silly trying to even begin to summarize the sheer level of detail that's going on here, because there is a lot. There is so much being done in so much density. This is the kind of thing where, if I was doing a proper review of this, I would have to either slow mode or constantly pause it to keep giving positives for the additional amount of stuff that's happening in the space of seconds. Very Star Wars, and I do mean that as a positive thing. So, then we get Vander's establishing scene, or more accurately, his second establishing scene, but the really strange thing is his first scene is part of his second scene. Turn me out for a second. So, what do I think of the art? It's terrible, I hate it, and it's the best thing ever. The establishment here... Is it really ISD? I noticed the camera lingered on him for a second. You gotta pay! Um, the establishment here is amazing. It's a very negative space establishment. We have... It's obvious, based on his first scene, that he was a badass back in the day, right? I mentioned this earlier, and I said I'd come back to it. There were armored troops with guns, and Cashel Gladio... Had had ten gifted subs just in the chamber, ready to go. And there's Cashel with that giant ass double double barreled sawed off, ready to go. And then 
Vander's up there with a, a couple of chunks of metal around his fists, hanging, right? Actually winning, to be quite honest with you. Winning in, in the only fight we actually see him engaging in there. It's a brief thing. It's a brief tidbit. Nobody gives a damn about my face. I can just turn off the webcam, right? Hang on, I'll just, I'll just, I got this. I got, this. I got this. There we go. So he's actually winning the freaking fight that he's fighting in. Um, and so we don't need to see more than that. Again, it's treating us like we have a freaking brain and we can assume this guy is actually a total badass. He is someone who can hang. Uh, don't know the specifics, don't need to know the specifics, because, but that's important because remember, he specifically laid down violence. And if you're paying attention, the entire rest of the episode, and I imagine this will continue past the episode's uh, credits, he is constantly trying to avoid any future entanglements of being violent as a reaction to what's going on. This, of course, uh, ties back into something that uh, Federation Builder mentioned earlier. You thought I missed it, but you were wrong. The guy missed nothing. The thing, uh, the idea of um, cycles, right? Uh, perpetual motion, cycles of violence, uh, reactions, causing reactions, causing reactions. It's doubly funny because I just read a thing about Pandaria. So <clears throat> what we see in him is that he is going extremely far out of his way to avoid that cycle. This also leads to his second point of negative character establishment because he walks over and sees that, uh, you know, the, the dude whose name I don't even remember and don't care about is trying to make a deal with two people. And the little dude's just this little little guy who's trying you know, very hard and, and you know, is obviously nowhere near on the same level as these two. And then, they've, and then we've got these two badasses who are like, no, listen. And it's actually funny because the two badasses fill the absolutely stereotypical archetype of the face and the heavy. The guy's the face. He's the one who's just talking through. And this is times change. We need to, we need to work with the new price. And the heavy's just back down there in the background with her dagger glaring at him the entire time. And that is exactly how you do it. I have literally used that tactic in real life corporate politics, by the way. Go ahead and guess which one I was. You might be surprised. So... A lot of that is is going. Oh, I know, Darth. But there's so much density. I feel overwhelmed a little bit. Uh, there's so much going on. So we use this as a scene to establish, you know, oh my god, the you know he's going to be overwhelmed and it's going to establish the thing. And then of course Vander walks over and is just like, hey, and then they brush him off rather rudely actually. And so the actor's like, okay, he comes over and he gives them a very simple thing. And I love the line. Never this little tip. Never piss off the guy who pours the drinks. And they look up and they see that the entire bar is just glaring at them. And you can see there's just this moment of... Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, but the point here is obviously this is a great badass scene and it's enjoyable, it's fun. But it's also serving a narrative point. This is Vander's mentality. He accomplishes his objective without firing a punch. And that's the point. He manages to out-talk and out-maneuver his way through this situation and, you know, actually de-escalates it. Rather than this happening, it stops. Cool. We got it. I noticed that, 040. Vander used the exact same tactic. He was the face, and the rest of the bar was the glare. By the way, Darkrai is correct, and actually several people were correct as well. I was the one glaring. I was the heavy during those negotiations. It makes sense. If, if, if I don't open my mouth, if I don't do any of the things that I do to convey communication to people, all you see is this big, dumb-looking guy glaring at you. Scribble, scribble, scribble. Anyways. <clears throat> so, great scene. Great establishment. Great follow-through. That's why I say it's technically... Even though it's technically two scenes, it's actually one scene. Because his first scene dovetails immediately into a second scene. It is functionally one scene. They're, they're two pieces of the same character establishment point. Thank you very, very much, Cashel, for the subs, as always. If you know what up to three things you'd like those to go towards, do please let me know. Thank you. Uh, it was 10, right? It was 10, yes. Actually, yes. I was very teal. I wish I could say I took that from teal. But alas, I, if you remember, I hadn't watched Stargate at that point in time. Because I watched the first two episodes of Stargate 
a three, I don't know, I hit Emancipation, and then I walked away from the show for a few years because Emancipation. So, Yee's eight. Octopath, Traveler, two. And Xenoblade, three. And for those of you tilting your head, don't worry about it. But for those of you who've seen Stargate, Emancipation! All right, so, moving on. <laughs> so, he gives this wonderful speech to Vi. He goes, he's like, hey, what's up? And I actually wrote down the entire speech. When people look up to you, you don't get to be selfish. You say, run, they run. You say, swim, they dive in. You light a fire, they show up with oil. But whatever happens, it's on you. I really don't want to get into to political politics for like the 15,000th time this week. But this is exactly my own mentality on leadership in general. The more of a public figure you are, the more of a leader figure you are, the more responsibility is incumbent upon you to hold and to bear and to burden. I mean that. I've, I've, I've believed that for years upon years. It You have to, like, the kind of thing that you or I could say casually as a mistake or as, a, as, as less like it's just something we could just toss out there. You, you can't really do that at certain levels. The higher up you are, the more responsibility you have because it's on you. People are listening to you, right? And so I like this speech, especially since he's clearly trying to, in, to impart upon her the ideas of doing things other than just running in and swinging with her fists. You'll also notice, and I'm sure you did, that Vi's fighting style is basically Vander's. You catch that? We saw it very briefly, and I even rewound to double-check this. The the literal animations that he's using to punch the trooper in the very beginning of the episode are the same type of animations she uses for several of the exact same type of attacks she uses during her fight. Yeah, exactly. So, cool. Um, so he's dead. Uh, Bender's totally dead. So, uh, Powder... You know, I, I, there's, I mentioned that I wasn't going to go down the rabbit hole of animations, but did you notice that while Milo was bouncing the ball off of the wall um, and Powder is listening through the door crack, there's this bit where they're talking about her and she, of course, has got to have the miscommunication thing. Um, and, and Powder physically flinches just a bit when the ball hits the wall. Oh. And just, just kind of recoils that I had to I had to comment on that. I had to comment on that. You'll also notice again to go into that animation, her her whole body lifts up a little bit and bounces a little bit more on its movements when she comes back with the one piece of the plutonium that she has. And then when she hears the little diatribe between Milo and Vi, it right back into slumping. Wonderful animation. Love the animation. Um, one moment, please. So, this also leads me to, yeah, monochrist, that's a good word for it. This leads me to the other big theme of the episode. Possibly the show? I don't know, this is speculative at this point. Don't tell me if I'm right or wrong. But, without knowing anything, this feels like a prequel to League of Legends. This feels like we're following the origin stories of a lot of the different characters and how they will eventually develop into the characters they will then be playable as in League of Legends. This feels like there's a bit of a generational thing going on. Um, we see several interactions with several of the younger folk and how they are taking after and also changing from the generation who are obviously the dominant characters, the ones who actually take up the majority of the screen time. It's just interesting to think about and see the shifts between the two. Also, can I just say that I really love the interesting, subtle bit of the fact that Vander took a bag of junk to sell to the guy so he could be there when the Enforcers showed up with a bag of junk he's trying to sell as if that's what was stolen. They never say that out, li out loud. The only thing that happens is this one bit with a shopkeep, I didn't catch his name, forgive me, just reacts to it like, really? <sighs> And then Vander's reaction to the really is, yeah, so you heard about the explosion. And at that point, the other guy's Benzo, thank you. The, Benzo's just like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And then they just move forward and don't address it again. They don't need to lay it out there. They don't need to turn to the camera and say, yeah, so, so. what's this? 
As you know, as one of your good old-time friends, this is clearly something we're doing in order to interact with someone from the upper world. And they're, you know, they don't have to do that. They don't have to do that. Well, I haven't, like, I don't know League, like, at all, Crazy North, so hopefully not at all. That's the idea. We'll see as we go throughout the course of the show. It's only nine episodes. So he has, he has, as you know, your father, who is very important to you. First line of dialogue. First line of dialogue. Ah. Uh, so the gas masks thing, uh, I, meant, I, I wanted to mention one other little tidbit about that because I'm not sure, I, I wrote down two major possibilities. Either it's literally a health thing, which might explain some of the uh, less, uh, more alien, we'll call it that way, more alien, less human looking people down there. Or, and this is my actual knee jerk thought, it's actually a cultural thing that maybe it literally just kind of doesn't smell well down there because there's not a lot of air circulation in a freaking chasm. And so it's more of an elitism thing. As you know, there was an explosion in the upper city. And then the Enforcer lady shows up. But this is where I had to pause the episode because I had to know the name of this woman. And I'm going to pronounce it wrong, and I feel bad for that. Her name is Shora Agdashlu. And I'm, I'm so sorry for screwing up her name. She's a great actress. I actually love her in pretty much everything I've seen her in. I want to see her in more things. She has a very distinct voice. Uh, I was actually just about to mention most of you probably recognize her as Admiral Ran from Mass Effect 2 and 3. But she's actually done a lot of stuff. Um, she's a major character in The Expanse. Uh, she plays Christian over in The Expanse, for example. Uh, great actress. And I just wanted to say, hearing her out of nowhere was just like... <gasps> I actually noticed quite a few voices I recognized. Of course, I, I, what would I be like if I didn't mention the fact that J.B. Blanc is playing freaking Vander? And you're probably thinking, who's J.B. Blanc? And to which I'm just going to look at you very uh, disapprovingly. While, while the face is over here explaining things, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be glaring at you. Scribble, scribble, scribble. Now, J.B. Blanc is awesome. Um, he's been doing some fantastic stuff over the years. The irony is. It's hard to tell you who J.B. Blanc is because he's in so many things that it's kind of hard to neat pick like one individual thing and be like, oh yeah, this thing. <laughs> it's this person from this specific thing. And it's like, eh, no. He also works as a voice director, by the way. In fact, he did a lot of voice direction for a game that has some really, really good voice acting. World of Warcraft. Anyways. Um... So you're probably thinking, who is J.B. Block? Well, some of you have been playing the, the Pandaria remix lately, right? He plays Rico. Rico, go. Punch him right in the duka. Yes, really. That's J.B. Blanc right there. That's the guy who voiced Vander. He's got some range, is what I'm trying to get at. That's why I, I jumped to that one. Um, he does a lot of stuff. He uh, Ryuhai uh, Hoshino in Yakuza Like a Dragon. Uh, he plays the Kingpin in the recent Spider-Man games. Um... He's Zinyak, the villain of Saints Row 4. Uh, he plays Kano in several of the recent Mortal Kombat games. He was Boris back in Metal Gear, uh, Re Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Oh, my God. Uh, like, like, he's done a bunch of stuff. He's done a whole bunch of stuff. It's, it, like I said, it's hard to pick a specific thing. Uh, he plays Rost over in Horizon Zero Dawn. These are all just video games, too. He does a bunch of other stuff. He's all over the place. Oh, in Arcane, he plays Vander. Anyways. <clears throat> but no, he's good. He's cool. Moving on, moving on. <laughs> so, uh... No, I, I can prove that's not true. Uh, Zach Taft. Give me a minute. Now, Zach Taft has questioned me, so now I've got to stop the stream and prove myself right or wrong. He also apparently plays Braum in Ruined King. I didn't know that. All right, so here we go. Kingpin in Spider-Man. Oh, yeah, they got some really good voice actors here. They also have got, um, I can't remember his name. He's the guy who voices Anduin. Uh, he played the punk kid. No, the, the game. The game. There you go. 
Not the movie. Nobody likes the movie. Here we go. J.B. Blanc, Kingpin. Apparently Steve Blum plays uh, Craven the Hunter. I didn't know that. Anyways, getting back on track. So, this is all awesome. Uh, I mentioned the gas mask. I mentioned Shora Adashalu, which I'm pronouncing extremely wrong. Uh, so then they do something very interesting. Something that's been on my mind a lot lately, I don't really have a good reason why, is structure. I even did two, three very impromptu videos uh, just to talk about gameplay structure recently. And I've never heard of a game before, Crazy so I, I don't do that. I'm the lore watcher. But a very, very common thing, it's called an establishing shot. It's called that for a reason. But the thing that's interesting is most people follow a fairly simple... Uh, formula for doing an establishing shot. Now, there's a reason for that, but if I might be so bold, I actually professionally disagree with that. I'm sorry, I'm getting too far ahead of myself. Structure. All right, we start with the camera super zoomed in on people, and we're talking, and we're talking, and we're talking, and then the camera slowly pans, and you see Tatooine, or you see the, the, the giant city of New London, or you see the distant green hills, of, or you see, you know what I'm talking about. It's the establishing shot. And the overwhelming formula is to push this establishing thought shot as far forwards as possible. The reason why is they want the audience to have an immediate visual idea of what they're looking at in order to then have context for all the events that happen. But in my experience, the inverse actually works better. And that's exactly what this episode does. We don't have an establishing shot until almost the last scene of the episode. In fact, it's the second to last scene of the episode. We have instead context before we get into... Um, we have context before we get into establishment. And I like that because it recontextualizes the establishing shot. Let me explain it differently this way. So what did we see? So we've got the bridge. Yep. Okay. Then, you know, the explosion, death, horribleness. Uh, then we show running through the streets of, you know, the, the, the high town, as I've been calling. I don't know what it's called. I don't care. Running, I think it's actually called Piltover. But anyways, we see running through the streets. Then we see running through the, the slums area. Then we see going down into the depths. And that's pretty much all of the scenes, all of the sets that need to be showcased for this. And each of them have a brief pseudo-establishing shot, but it's very brief. Only lasts a few seconds and is very limited in its scope and its scale. Then after all of the events of the episode, then the camera pans out and we see the entire city. Now we have context for what we're seeing. And that's the way I prefer it, personally. This is just a professional choice here. Um, I, there's nothing wrong with doing it the other way, necessarily. But this way, it's like, ah, okay. So now we understand. That's where we were initially. Then we went over there. Then we went down here. Now we're over here and this is where this is. Now that we have already seen the individual locations, we can place them on the metaphorical map. Make sense? It's a smart move, and it does a really good job of, of getting across a lot of the geography, which is very, very important for this kind of a thing. But then we have the actual last scene, and see our first real villain. There's so much density here, I'm just... I'm, I'm thrown. I'm, I'm, I'm thrown for how much density is in this scene. Did you notice it's not actually dark in the scene? And I was just thinking, yes, it was. No, it was actually very brightly lit, but it was very uh, cast shadow, cast light. I forget what that's actually called. Um, what I've got right here is a distributed light, right? It just lights up the whole area equally. But what they have in this scene is like it's more like a spotlight, right? So they've got very, very bright lights going in a specific direction. So it looks more stark, right? So you've got part of your face is very brightly lit, and then the rest of your face is very darkly lit. Stuff like that, right? So that's important because it's good lighting design. It's something that a lot of people fail at. A lot of people, yeah, it is very interrogator interrogatory, but it also is good for just visual design. Um, it is in just visual presentation because a lot of people, and this is very true in video games, tend to forget that dark means you can't see. I know that sounds very stupid. Please, please continue to watch me for other wonderful insights into the fact that water is in fact wet. But you'd be shocked how many people forget that dark equals can't see. 
And so they want some place to be dark for some kind of thematic or mood or vibe reason, and they just turn down the lights, and get, lo and behold, you can't see. How many times, how many times have I, uh, how many times have I pointed out in a game, it's pretty rare, actually, that, uh, you know, at nighttime, you can actually still see what the hell you're doing and where you're going. Or the opposite of that, for that matter. So good lighting design and good, uh, good, good tone setting, kind of a thing going on. And we've got the giant guy with the horrible-looking tattoo, the really, the really screwed-up lens camera angle thing, just trying to emphasize how how terrified our thug is. I don't even catch his name. The thug is. Uh, we've got the cat. We've got this gigantic fish roaming in the background, which, in addition to being horrifying-looking gets across two things very, very quickly and immediately. First of all, this is clearly someone's lair. Because the only reason you have a giant, evil-looking fish outside of a window is because you've got a lair. Let's just be honest about that. But also, it gives us a bit of that all-important geography. Once again, we now know a little bit of where we are because we know we're underwater. Okay, good establishment. And in the background, there's this guy who's just sort of casually injecting a drug into his eye. And at first I thought they were going to go a specific direction with that, but instead it's very normal. Did you notice how, and I think this is on purpose, I think there's a high factor here for me to presume this is deliberate. The guy injecting whatever drug into his eye does so without changing his tone. It's not like, uh, so there's two ways they could have done this, right? They could have been like, oh, talk, 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 talk. <sighs> talk, 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 and actually made it so his tone changed after injecting the drugs to indicate some kind of variance in like, ah, I feel better. They could have also done something where it causes him some pain or discomfort as he does it. Talk, 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 you know, they could have done that. They didn't do either. Instead, he just keeps talking as if nothing's changed, as if nothing's altered, which is interesting. I do feel like it's on purpose. And it says a lot about how often this guy has to do this, whatever it is he's doing. Second thing is, of course, uh, they murder a cat. And I gotta be honest, that is probably the most overt thing in the entire episode. I'm not even mad. They just, they just go right for the jugular, right? If there is one really easy way to establish someone as villainous, it's have them murder a cat. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Buffy the, Sl the Vampire Slayer movie, not the show, that's actually how they established the villain of that thing, is he went to have a midnight snack. And I'm not going to fill in the rest of the details there. I think you figured it out. So, dog? Nobody likes dogs. Don't be ridiculous. And yeah, using a mouse, too. Just using a little bit of a mouse. Great stuff. Um, and so, we've got our main plot hook. There's obviously something going on. Whatever was in that scientist's lab was something more than we think. There's obviously some kind of horror drug. We do know it's a drug because that's how they f they fed it to the rat. We know the horror drug turns them into the Hulk, so that's horrifying, and it allowed them to kill the uh, the cat in a very quick and horrifying manner. So that's messed, and that's the episode. I haven't talked about the characters. Wait, there's there's characters in this. Uh, okay, right. So there's what's his face? What's her face? Uh, what's its face, what their face, and what his face. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being facetious. You're right, I haven't talked about the characters yet. I don't have anything to say about the characters yet. They're very well acted, they're very well animated. Um, everything that's character presented is something I've already really talked about. Vi is obviously someone who was very much trying to follow in Vander's footsteps from when he was younger, not from the way he is now. Vander is... Va Vander, I talked about him already. Um... Powder is someone who is very clearly and obviously suffering from PTSD because she just read the Warcraft Chronicles Volume 4. And uh, Milo is the rogue. He's kind of one note at the moment. Uh, I didn't catch his name as the big guy. He's kind of one note at the moment. I did like... I already thought his name. Benzok? Benzo? The shopkeep. He was memorable. And I loved the fact that there's an enforcer who has, has a deal with Vander, which makes sense. It's very logical that Vander would be trying to negotiate with rather than to subvert the local authorities because that's the overall arc he's been on so far. But again, that's more about him than it is about her. So, now we talk about 
reviewing the episode. Now, I've always, I've thought for years about doing a proper review of things like this, and the problem with that is that I, while I would love to do that, and I would, it takes time, and uh, I don't think anybody wants to sit here while I just kind of give away positives and negatives myself, especially since I kind of, by definition, have to do it in a vacuum. I wouldn't be able to share it with you all and have you be that second bit of oversight to look over it. So, instead, what we do is we give it a color. I talked about this earlier, but for those of you not aware, uh, black is at the bottom. That's Lamentations. Then we go blues, greens, r yellows, oranges, reds, purples. Yellow is average. That's that's the that's the easy thing. It's right there. Boom, right in the middle. It's average. Uh, purples, oh, so the general range here, it's actually a very, very simple system. Uh, greens to reds is the normal range, for lack of a better way to put that. Most episodes in general will not go below green, and most episodes will not go above red, and so we can establish floors and ceilings. Uh, blues are for pretty terrible episodes, and you know I'm actually, anybody who's watched my, me for any length of time, you know that Lamentation status is something extra, right? It's, it's something above and beyond. Um, so the next thing I was going to point out, Lord Harriman pointed this out, thank you for reminding me, is that this, this is judged across all of history, just like we do game reviews. I'm not judging the av an average episode for Arcane. I am judging an average episode across all of television ever, and I have consumed a fairly large amount of television in my life. Make sense? So if something is yellow, that's pretty average for all of TV. Make sense? This is one of the reasons why Justified was so freaking insane. Now, green through red is pretty easy to understand. Like I said, blue has to be pretty bad. Both Lamentation and Purple at the top require something extra. A little bit of extra oomph that pushes it above or below simply being great or terrible. So that's my question to you. What color would you give this episode? I always ask the viewers and I always debate this back and forth. And in one case, we disagreed so heavily that Mr. Red has never forgiven me for it to this very day. Now, I would say, personally, before I look at Chad for just a second, that for me, the absolute bottom I could give this episode is an orange. And I don't think it even goes that far. I feel, personally, that the floor here is probably red. But I also have to admit, I just, I just can't quite push this up to purple. Because, again, the requirement for that is that it's got to have that extra little something. Something above and beyond. Something that just pushes it beyond merely being great. Um, that's just me. That's just that's just my take and my vibe. But this is a fantastic intro. It definitely has me interested and engaged. I'm very curious what's going to happen, where it's going to go, and how much worse it's going to get. Is Unimatrix Zero Lamentation? That's a good question. I haven't rewatched Rumination. Unimatrix. I haven't re-watched Unimatrix Zero yet. However, I am currently going through Voyager as part of the Star Trek lore run. And so when I get back to it, I can answer you on that. Having said that, probably. It's probably the only Lamentation post-season 3. So... I'm seeing some, some consensus here. And I do admit this is definitely debatable, and the mere fact that it's debatable says something. I think we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and give this a red. We'll go ahead and lock that in as that. Uh, actually, no, Crazy Norse. I've never really found a method or metric to do so easily as amusing as that probably sounds. So, for those of you on YouTube, 